Dave King sent me an email a while back and said, we'd like you to come and participate on a symposium about DMT as a neurotransmitter. And I answered him and said, I don't think I'm the right guy because I don't believe DMT is a neurotransmitter. And he said, that's precisely why I want you to come and talk. <laughs> so I feel a little bit like a fish swimming upstream at this point, but I'm just going to present some science facts. This is not my typical seminar. It was very difficult because uh, although I don't believe DMT is a neurotransmitter, uh, still you can't just say I don't believe it. So I had to go spend a lot of time in the literature finding precedents for papers, finding out what people would cite, etc. So it's going to largely consist of some really boring scientific facts, but I'll try to lighten it up by discussing what they actually mean in the context of DMT. And the previous speakers have saved me some time, so I don't have to spend much time on introduction. I didn't know where I was going to be placed in this uh, panel, so I had background material. We can skip a lot of it. We can probably skip this, except the pineal was equated with the eye of Horus back in Pharaonic Egypt. It's been back for a long time. Go to the next slide. And this is just to tell you that ideas about what the pineal does really developed around the 1500s and 1600s, before we knew any physiology or medicine. So this romantic notion of the pineal gland as a third eye, a metaphysical third eye, these were developed independently of any medical knowledge or scientific logic or facts. So, and that sort of mystery and fantasy has permeated, has permeated up into the present time, as, as Graham St. John told us. <coughs> The pineal gland is a neuroendocrine organ in the brain whose main and most conserved function is the nighttime secretion of melatonin. And it's a small gland about the size of a large pea, or imagine cutting off the rubber eraser on a pencil. It doesn't weigh very much, less than two tenths of a gram. And <clears throat> it, uh, let's see. Okay, this is just a uh, size average uh, weight between 100 and 180 milligrams, again, less than two tenths of a gram. And uh, in penolectomized rats, if you take their pineal gland out, it really doesn't affect their sleep. They have, still have REM sleep, they're be behaviorally normal. In humans, if you take out the pineal gland, there's no apparent behavioral effect. So if it was this really important thing that connected us with our spirit, you'd think that penolectomy would maybe kill people or turn them into devils or something. That doesn't happen. You've seen this already, tryptophan hydroxylase is the first step in the synthesis of serotonin, and this is the rate limiting step. But this decarboxylase, uh, which uh, Jim referred to as AADC, that's an L-aromatic amino acid decarboxylase. It decarboxylates, takes off this carboxy group for hydroxytryptophan, for tryptophan, for uh, tyrosine. It's a biosynthetic enzyme for all the monoamine transmitters, so it's not specific for DMT. <clears throat> This aeroalkylamine uh, N-acetyltransferase is a rate limiting step where it takes serotonin as a starting material and puts an acetyl group. And then we have hydroxyindole methyltransferase, HOIMT, which uh, Jim also talked about. And this is melatonin. Now, the pineal gland is small, less than two tenths of a gram. Um, it makes melatonin, which is a, uh, an endocrine uh, transmitter essentially that regulates to some extent Di diurnal or circadian rhythm. And what I want to show you here is mean melatonin production in healthy adults is estimated at 28.8 micrograms per day, or at night between about 2.8 and 4.6 micrograms per hour. Now everyone here knows what a microgram is. 100 micrograms of LSD is an effective dose. Some people microdose with 10 micrograms of LSD, uh, and it has an undetectable effect so now we have a compound that's produced at about 30 micrograms per day, three to five micrograms per hour at night. Tiny amounts, and that's the sole function of this gland. It's devoting its energy to producing melatonin. And it works because the affinity of melatonin for its receptors is 0.5 to nanomolar. And that's about comparable to the affinity of LSD for its serotonin 2A receptors. So this is a very high affinity ligand produced in very tiny amounts. And this is, as far as we know, the principal function of the pineal gland. <clears throat> now here's the biosynthesis of DMT, which you've seen. Here's that AADC, which is an amino acid ecoboxylase that works with tyrosine, phenylalanine, tryptophan. And then endoethylamine and methyltransferase. Now, there's no known physiological role for DMT. You've heard lots of speculation. <clears throat> It's detected in only trace amounts in cerebral spinal fluid, trace amounts in pineal microdialysis, using the most sensitive analytical methods out there. 
liquid chromatography, mass spec, mass spec, mass spec, which uh, they, uh, uh, Steve Barker uses, which they use to analyze perfusate from pineal gland. This is really a sensitive method. Now, if you treat animals with an irreversible monamine oxidase inhibitor, something that prevents the destruction of DMT, you treat them once a day for two days and then analyze the press for the presence of DMT in the brain, you detect between 10 and 15 picograms of DMT per gram of brain tissue. Now, a picogram is one thousandth of a microgram. So 10 picograms would be 0 0.01 micrograms in brain of rats treated with an inhibitor of the enzyme that breaks DMT down, just to give you a sense of how much DMT is actually in the brain. And in rat uh, pineal microdialysis, which Jim also referred to, this is what they use, uh, tandem uh, LC, tandem mass spec, LC, mass spec, mass spec. There's no quantification. It's detectable, and I don't deny that DMT is produced in trace amounts in the body. The real issue is, is it relevant? Now let me point out something else. The affinity of DMT for its receptor, and we measured this in my laboratory, 65 nanomole. Now melatonin is produced 29 micrograms per day, and the receptor affinity for melatonin is 0.5 nanomole. Traces of DMT are produced, and its affinity is 65 nanomole, very low affinity. So you really need a lot of DMT to activate that receptor, and I'll tell you what happens. Also, uh, Timo mentioned that Julius Axelrod identified this enzyme in 1961. I get nervous. <laughs> this happened in an era when there was the idea that schizophrenia was caused by some endogenous psychotogen. Stephen Cesara in the 50s had identified DMT as a psychoactive compound and we knew its effects. So they said, oh, we've got this enzyme we've got, we don't know what it does, but let's look at tryptamine and serotonin and see if it methylates it. Lo and behold, this enzyme, INMT, methylated tryptamine. So the enzyme was named endoethylamine and methyl transferase. It was named just because that was the first substrate they found where it was methylated. <clears throat> it's widely distributed in mammalian tissues, a lot in the lung. We don't know why it's there, and I can address that if we have time. It is in the pineal gland. Jim has talked about that. This was the Society for Neuroscience Abstract, and she's done some really nice, elegant work to prove it's there. Nice work, I believe you. <clears throat> but what does the DMT do? Is it actually synthesized in those tissues? And if so, how is it utilized or released under normal or altered conditions? And this is from Barker. And I've given references for all these things that may be controversial. Two unique aspects of this enzyme compared to other biogenic amine transferases include broad substrate specificity. It will methylate lots of different things besides tryptamine, and we have no accepted biologic function. <clears throat> Now, even though it was originally discovered as a result of interest in a possible formation of an endogenous psychotogen, uh, including tryptamine or serotonin, the fact that that's its role is probably not true. We don't know what the role of that enzyme actually is. And the reason for that is the apparent KM, this is a Michaelis constant, KM, and it represents the affinity of the substrate for the enzyme. So the KM of tryptamine for INMT is 270 micromolar. That means to sort of activate this INMT enzyme to half maximum velocity, you need to have it in the presence of a concentration of 270 times 10 to the minus 6 molar tryptamine. Now just for comparison, the KM, the Michaelis constant of acetylcholine for acetylcholinesterase, this is the enzyme when your muscles move, acetylcholine is released and you need it terminated really quickly, so acetylcholinesterase breaks down that enzyme. The KM of acetylcholine is about 15 micromole. Catechol-O-methyltransferase, which is an O-methyltransferase that, that puts a methyl group on dopamine in the brain and terminates its action, its KM, dopamine for the COMT, is 15 micromole, similar to what we see with acetylcholinesterase. <clears throat> Yet, INMT, the KM for tryptamine, is 270 micromole. If INMT was really supposed to be methylating tryptamine, if that was its natural substrate, you expect that KM to be much smaller. So uh, that's just a fact to keep in mind. Now there's another N-methylase, N-methyltransferase in the lung that's there to methylate histamine. 
histamine and methyltransferase. And again, what we see is the KM is around 11 micromolar. So these enzymes for their natural substrates, the KM values are around 15 or so, 10 to 15 micromolar. Tryptamine and INMT, 270. So there's a real question as to whether that's the endogenous substrate. Now this is a curve I reproduced from Rick Strassman's 1994 paper, and he and uh, Gallimore have published a, a proposal to, give an, to develop an infusion process to give continuous infusion of DMT, keep people into a DMT space to see if they could communicate with alien entities. Here's what happens when you inject 0.4 milligrams per kilogram of DMT fumarate into humans. This is the average plasma concentration from 10 subjects. And this is what you see with intravenous administration. These are plasma levels in nanograms per mil. You see a rapid increase of plasma <coughs> concentration and it drops off. The 0.2 milligram per kilogram came up as a peak in about 45 as opposed to 90. <coughs> now, what does that correspond to? So they say breakthrough based on analysis, a really nice analysis, breakthrough, breakthrough into the DMT space, whatever that is, occurs when the effect site concentration reaches about 60 nanograms per milliliter. That's right about here. And that's 60 micrograms per liter, or a concentration of about 318 nanomore. That's the effective concentration when DMT is really producing the you know, alien communication and so forth. So they developed an infusion procedure which involves giving an initial bolus of 25 milligrams over 30 seconds and then continuing over uh, 100 nanograms per mil, et cetera. So but just to give you an idea, this is the kind of concentration you're working at. And the KI of DMT for the serotonin 2A receptor is 65 nanomole. So you see you have plenty of concentration to activate that receptor. <clears throat> now you heard a reference to DMT being concentrated in the brain and staying there for a week. So that's based on partly on a study that was published by Cohen and Vogel in 1972 where they said the brain plasma ratio of DMT of 5.4 in rats, and I should have put quotes around this, seems to indicate, end quote, that the compound can cross the blood-brain barrier easily and is, in quotes, perhaps accumulated by an active transport. Perhaps accumulated by an active transport. Well, the brain plasma ratio, if you give DMT to a rat, you sacrifice the rat, you homogenize the brain, measure the DMT concentration, measure the DMT concentration in plasma, ratio of 5, 5.4. Drugs that are not actively taken up can give those kinds of ratios. So there's an antipsychotic drug called Abilify or Aripiprazole. It has a brain plasma ratio of about five. And it's not actively transported to the brain. So the brain plasma ratio is not proof of active transport. That's all been inferred. <clears throat> now another uh, reference we heard, uh, Edie talked about this remaining in the brain for up to one week, published in 2011 by Vitali. That is a terrible paper. It's awful. I don't know how it was published. It wasn't about DMT at all. They wanted to radioactively label DMT so they could study its kinetics. But did they use radioactive DMT? No. They used radioactive 2-iodo DMT, which places a radioactive iodine atom in the 2 position. DMT doesn't have that. So this indication that it's staying in the brain for a week was related to radioactivity staying in the brain for a week. So it wasn't DMT, and all their conclusions don't apply to DMT, but they've been interpreted by many people as applying to DMT. Now what happens when you iodinate DMT in the two position? If you iodinate LSD in the two position, it kills its activity completely. We could infer from that that probably this is not an active agonist molecule. If anything, it might be an antagonist. Secondly, the solubility of DMT in lipid, if you measure, if you take a lipid phase, typically they'll use normal octanol and uh, a C8 alcohol, and it's a two-phase system with uh, aqueous buffer that represents partitioning in the human body, and you put in some DMT and you wait to it gets to equilibrium, and then you measure how much DMT is in the octanol and how much is in the water. That's a partition, partition coefficient you can measure, and it's about 100 for DMT. So typically they use it to log to the base 10. So this is a log P of 1.8, about two, that would be 100. So the partition coefficient of DMT is about 100. Iodo DMT, iodine makes it much more lipid soluble, 
And now the partition coefficient is log p of 2.5. And I can't do any logs in my head, but it's somewhere between 100 and 1,000. So you've changed the lipid solubility properties of the drug. It's not DMT anymore. It's got this iota, it's probably changed its pharmacology. And furthermore, they say, further, they failed to identify metabolites of this compound, suggesting it's not metabolized by monamine oxidase. Well, we know that DMT is rapidly metabolized by monamine oxidase. So this suggests that this compound isn't even metabolized by monamine oxidase. So it has a different lipid solubility, it's probably got different pharmacology, and it's not metabolized. And this has been cited as evidence that DMT accumulates in the brain for up to a week. Really bad science. Now, <clears throat> Yanni et al., 1986, pre-treated rats with pargolene or reserpine. Pargolene is an irreversible inhibitor of monamine oxidase. If you treat rats with pargolene, their normal DMT levels would build up. Or if you gave them DMT, they wouldn't be broken down very quickly. And with reserpine, they did experiments with and without reserpine. So reserpine blocks the reuptake of compounds into vesicles and nerve terminals. So if DMT is taken up into the brain, and as Nick Cozy suggests, maybe pumped into vesicles and stored like normal neurotransmitters, what would that mean? Reserpine would block that from happening. They used C11 labeled radioactive DMT, where the C11 was on the methyl, as it should have been. And the process of DMT accumulation had the properties of an active transport process, whatever that means. They didn't actually measure it. They just inferred maybe it was active. And in experiments with reserpine, which blocked accumulation into the vesicles, it had no effect on their subcellular distribution, implying that it was not expected that it would accumulate in synaptic vessels of nerve endings. So even if it gets into a neuron, it's probably not accumulated in the vesicles. And you know, MDMA is taken up by the transporter and gets into neurons. It isn't stored in vesicles. It causes the release of endogenous serotonin. May well be that DMT in high enough concentrations would release endogenous serotonin. But it's not accumulated based on these experiments. People ignore these or earlier studies or either they misinterpret them. And since I said I didn't believe DMT was a neurotransmitter, I had that proof. I couldn't just say I believed it. <clears throat> now, as you've heard with respect to the signal 1 receptor, I'm not going to say much about this. Um, low levels of the receptor are found in CNS regions, but also in the motor neurons. But the, DM, the KD, the affinity of DMT for the signal 1 receptor, is 14.75 micromolar. And as you've seen, if we go to Strassman's highest plasma level of 90 nanograms per mil, that translate, translates out to about, say, 500 nanomolar. 14.75 micromolar is the same thing as 14,750 nanomolar. So that means you have to have that concentration of DMT really to have much of an effect on sigma-1 receptors. And yet the concentration that Strassman gave, which was a whopping dose, you'd never see that normally in humans. If you did, we'd all be tripping here instead of listening to me. 500 nanomolar. 14, almost 15,000 nanomolar versus 500. It's just not relevant to think of DMT being produced in quantities sufficient to activate the sigma-1 receptor. Also, Fontanilla et al. state that DMT injection induces hypermotility in rodents concurrently treated with a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. That's the only way you can see that, pargoline, citing Jenner for the basis for that. And this hypermotility is not antagonized by blockers of dopamine or serotonin receptors. Now, <clears throat> Jenner gave DMT to these mice, or rats, and hypermotility, they ran around a lot. And they're claiming that that activation, what, that hypermotility wasn't blocked by dopamine or serotonin receptor blockers. And so this was a sigma-1 receptor paper, so they inferred that that's, maybe it's a sigma-1 receptor. But if you go back and read this Jenner paper in 1980, they did block the hypermotility with dopamine and serotonin receptor blockers. So this is just an erroneous statement. <clears throat> so if DMT doesn't produce all these ma ma uh, magnificent out-of-body experiences, and dreaming and all that, what is in there that could be producing these effects? We know they occur, and so everyone likes to think it's DMT. Well, there are some logical explanations that we don't have to invoke DMT. First of all, in the brain, we know about endogenous morphins called enkephalins or endorphins, including dynorphin. Are any of you in here long distance runners, long runners? There must be a couple people. Yeah, not everybody's sitting at home smoking dope. So, <laughs> <laughs> for long distance runners, I can't run long distance because it gets to the point where I have a pain threshold and I have to stop. 
And that happens, I understand, for all long distance runners, but when they get to that pain threshold, they push through, they get a second win, they feel kind of euphoric, and it's great. That's the production of endogenous endor endorphins, enkephalins. And if you give a runner a blocker of opioid receptors like naloxone, they won't get that second win. They won't be able to run a long time. So these are endogenous morphine-like compounds. And dynorphin is an extremely potent uh, endogenous compound of that type that specifically activates the kappa opioid receptor. Now, what's the kappa opioid receptor? Everybody's heard of salvinorin A. Salvinorin A exerts its effect by a very selective activation of kappa opioid receptors. Dynorphin is the natural endogenous ligand for kappa opioid receptors, and it's produced at times of stress. So well, here's one possibility, right? And endorphin has actually been shown it is a neurotransmitter. It's synthesized in neurons, it's released, it has a physiological mechanism. And in addition, notice we don't need very much dynorphin to be secreted because the affinity of dynorphin for the kappa receptor is 0.44 nanomore in the same order of magnitude as melatonin for its receptors or LSD for the 5-HD2A receptor. So trace amounts of dynorphin can produce dissociative effects by the kappa receptor. Now, <clears throat> I love these experiments, Gmo. You had a couple on asphyxia and cardiac arrest. They're great. And this, I think, is closer to the explanation of what happens. So we know what the near-death experience is, and there's been a lot of speculation, and Strassman says, you know, maybe secretion of DMT, and so it's trying to fit a round hole into a square peg or something. Okay, so what uh, GEMO's lab found was that cardiac arrest stimulates a marked surge of global coherence of EEG, basically activation of the brain. Mammalian brain activity becomes translately and highly synchronized at near death. This was really surprising. This was a really interesting paper. It's published in Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, peer-reviewed, top journal, very nice. <coughs> the data suggests the mammalian brain has the potential for high levels of internal information processing during clinical death. The levels of, of functional connectivity for all rats at near death were nearly as high as waking for all frequencies, significantly higher than under anesthesia, and the return of these neurocorrelates after cardiac arrest, exceeding waking state, provides strong evidence for the potential of heightened cognitive processing in near death. And I thought this was really interesting because why would that happen? Why would your brain get really active when you were near death? Well, think about your cardiac arrest or asphyxiation. Something up here knows that you have a serious problem down here. And you hear about people being in serious accidents and time slows down and they watch things happen very slowly and they have time to interact and act. I think this activation of cortical function is related to a survival mechanism where the body knows it's about to die and the brain becomes very active, puts, pulls out all the stops, starts running on all eight cylinders and says, what can we do to save ourselves? That's my speculation. So it's consistent with conscious processing in near death and provides a framework and this is from your paper provides a scientific framework to begin to explain the highly lucid and real and real mental experiences reported by near death. <coughs> Five minutes, I might make it. Okay, uh, just go down through here. This is a list of things, just hit them one after another. This is related largely to EEG activation, global surge of synchronized cortical, uh, cortical gamma activity signifies an internally aroused brain, supports the concept that the mammalian brain is capable of high levels of information processing. Next slide. And this is, that was one with uh, cardiac arrest, and then she did another one for asphyxia. And this is from that paper. Asphyxia generates a brainstorm <coughs> of neurochemicals, and a sustained surge of a large set of core neurotransmitters. Cortical norepinephrine went up 30-fold, serotonin surged more than 20-fold, serotonin activates 5-HD2A receptors, Cortical dopamine, also excitatory, surged more than 12-fold. This is probably why you saw that increased activation of the brain. And finally, she didn't do this. This is another paper. But we know that in hypoxic situations, glutamate, excess glutamate, is released or produced. And what's the significance of that? How does ketamine work? We know ketamine can boost out-of-body experiences into social states as well. Ketamine raises extracellular levels of glutamate. So here's another possibility for activation of the brain. So, conclusions. My conclusions, you can, like Ripley said, believe it or not. DMT is not produced in concentration significant to activate CNS 5-HD2A receptors and is rapidly broken down by NAO if it is produced. 
There's no evidence to suggest that DMT can be accumulated within the brain or within neurons at significant concentrations. Such inferences either are not supported by direct experimental evidence or are based on flawed experiments. Endorphins, especially dynorphin, are released during stress. Dynorphin has high affinity for kappa opioid receptors, which can mediate hallucinations and out-of-body experiences. And other endorphins and kephalins can mediate euphoria and analgesia. Asphyxiation or cardiac arrest paradoxically, the brain activation resulted in marked increases of brain neurotransmitters such as dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin, the latter of which can stimulate 5-HT2A receptors and Asphyxia induces excessive release of the excitatory amino acid glutamate in drugs such as ketamine, which also raised cortical glutamate, can produce out-of-body experiences. So although the romantic notion that DMT is released from the pineal gland to produce altered states of consciousness at various times of stress is appealing, I say to some, it's appealing to many, science and logic suggest that other and more well-studied systems provide more sound explanation for out-of-body experiences. And I think that's it. So thank you.